Now, if I'd have had time, I'd have shown you a video to start. I'll just give you one 10 second clip of the video, which just sets the scene. And it's called The Scatlings of Africa by Johnny Clegg and Savunka. And I've used that title, I've, I've just grabbed that title. There's a YouTube link there if you want to go and see the, 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 that video later. But as time is short, we'll move straight on. So during this lecture, we're going to look at the evidence for and against uh, Africa as the site of origin of modern humans. Another caveat I have to say is that working out which of these two lectures, the first one that I gave last week, or this one to give first, is a bit of a quandary. Uh, I think actually the way that evidence has worked out in the last year or so, perhaps I need to move this one to the front and that one to the second. But the two kind of intermesh, these two ideas uh, of uh, out of Africa, recent African origins, and the question of whether archaic humans have contributed to our gene pool. But let's get back to the central narrative. Also, just to get you excited, we will end this lecture like no other lecture with a summary not on a slide, but as in the form of a rap. I won't be doing the rap, but you will get some hip-hop at the end to summarise the lecture, just to get you excited. So if we go back to, to Darwin, Darwin didn't say much about human origins in, in 1859 in The Origin of Species. He was a bit uh, shy at that time of creating uh, problems and controversy. But a few years later, or a decade or so later, in 1871, in The Descent of Man, he speculated that humans had probably originated in Africa. And this was his argument, which is that if you look around the world and look at extinct organisms and their closest relatives, they tend to go together in the same region. And um, he thought that perhaps the extinct apes closest to chimpanzees and gorillas were our ancestors and that they lived in Africa. How many of you in the room here think you have recent African origin, ancestry? Just as again, so a bit of audience participation. <laughs> by, by recent, I mean, say, within the last 30% uh, of humanity's existence. How many of you think you have African ancestry? One there, one there, one there. Okay, well, we'll take a straw poll at the end and see what, if we change our minds. So, Darwin said that, but actually nobody really listened very much. And in the years after Darwin, the focus moved away from Africa. Part of the reason, in those days, I think you can argue that most Europeans, if I upset him, <laughs> he doesn't like hip-hop, obviously. Um, back, back then, just about all Europeans were what we would now call racists. Uh, they held this view that Europeans were the pinnacle of nature and all that kind of rubbish, and it was obvious to them that they couldn't have come from Africa. And that, that racist idea was bolstered by the, the finding of archaic fossil humans outside of Africa. So the first finds were in Asia and in Europe. We mentioned Neanderthals before. There was a primitive human skull found in Heidelberg. There was this, uh, I put an asterisk there, it was Piltdown Man, which actually turned out to be a forgery uh, found in, in, uh, in, in England, in the, near the village of Piltdown. Actually, next year is the centenary of that discovery, and there's going to be a lot of whodunits as to who actually made that forgery. But that, that plus these discoveries in Asia, Java Man and then Peking Man, cast uh, the focus away from Africa to looking at uh, Eurasia as the source of modern humans. And these are, there are some early theories floating around. A guy called uh, Weidenreich in the 1930s said, well, what happened was that Homo erectus, the predecessor species, turned into Homo sapiens everywhere, but populations retained this local kind of racial features. Another alternative view was that actually all those fossils out there, primitive people like Homo erectus and Neanderthals, were irrelevant because it's clear that we humans had been a, a separate, pristine, honourable lineage going back long periods of time into the distant past. And actually all the fossils were just a distraction. And it was this long pre-Sapiens lineage uh, which was just cryptic, separate from all those archaic forms. Again, it's kind of, you know, 
it, it, it's a form of chauvinism that we can't possibly be related to those people with those horrible brow ridges and whatever. Another idea was that there was a pre-Neanderthal ancestor uh, based on some f fossils found in, um, in Israel, uh, well, now called Israel, then called Palestine, um, that there was a pre-Neanderthal ancestor that diverged into modern humans and into Neanderthals. In fact, nowadays we do, if you like, recognise that Africa is the cradle of humanity <coughs> because if we look from a modern perspective, certainly the earliest hominid specimens, the specimens of fossils on the lineage leading to modern humans since we separated from the chimpanzees, they've all been found in Africa. And there's a list of some of the uh, finds and the, ge the genera and so forth there. The earliest Homo erectus fossils are in Africa. But one of the interesting findings is that actually those Homo erectus, shortly after that, we find Homo erectus uh, fossils outside of Africa. So nobody disputes that actually Homo erectus left Africa very early on. And that's sometimes called Out of Africa 1, the first uh, movement of our ancestors out of Africa. But the, the, the crux of the, the question we're going to discuss today is where did actually our species, Homo sapiens, originate? And how did it come to people the world? Well, if you're going to be a racist, you might as well call yourself with a racist name. This guy, Carlton Kuhn, you can't make these names up. He was an anthropologist who in the 1960s came up with this idea that there were quite separate lineages, again, you know, racial forms, and they all had very long ancestry. Two of them, the Capoid and the Negroid, as he called them, we would now call them the, the Bushmen and, and, and Africans. The, uh, these ancestors, these lineages had a long time in Africa, but the other lineages there, the Australoid, Mongoloid, and Caucasoid, as he called them, uh, had dispersed um, but they had, had arisen within Homo erectus after its dispersal from Africa. Um, and again, this kind of racist nonsense. If Africa was the cradle of mankind, he said, it was only in different kindergarten. Europe and Asia were our principal schools. Another uh, American, Loring Brace, came up with this idea of a Neanderthaloid phase that maybe somewhere along this, these <coughs> roots here, these lineages were turning into uh, a Neanderthal kind of uh, phase and then uh, becoming more modern as time went on. But the idea was that somehow or other, each of these lineages became modern Homo sapiens independently, travelling along different trajectories. Uh, one other final hypothesis before we move to the, to, to the centre, central two hypotheses we're going to discover, something called the spectrum hypothesis, which was there was a kind of blending of modern and archaic characteristics in different lineages at, at different times and in different places. It's a bit of an ill-defined kind of hypothesis. But since about the 1970s or so, there have really been two competing theories about the origins of modern humans. Um, and those of you who came to Chris Stringer's talk will know that he uh, was uh, and is one of the architects of what's known as the recent African origin theory, or sometimes called the out of Africa uh, theory. Um, and here we just have to make that note that actually there were, we know at least two exoduses from, from Africa, the out of Africa. One we already mentioned was Homo erectus leading Africa. What we're talking about here is out of Africa two, that uh, a Homo sapiens population uh, dispersed from Africa. And Homo sapiens originated in Africa recently. That's contrasted with uh, a theory known as uh, multi-regionalism. Um, Milford Wolpoff has been the principal uh, proponent of that idea. He's not the only one, He's other people as well. But keeping things simple, you can argue it's Stringer versus Wolpoff in this. And here he suggested that there was actually a continuity of gene exchange across the whole of Homo erectus's um, uh, range uh, through Africa into Europe and Asia and it was all this gene flow going on, and the whole population of humans, of Homo erectus, turned into Homo sapiens uh, gradually, um, and, uh, and that's how we got modern human populations. Now Chris Stringer, I just uh, borrowed this slide from him from his talk that he gave the other week. Uh, he was the first to, to start to put some good, hard evidence on, onto these theories, and he looked at cranial measurements 
uh, from lots of fossils. He went around Europe collecting all the fossils he could and measuring the skulls and uh, actually fed the information into a very primitive computer uh, and compared lots of different measurements across all these specimens. And he came up with a, a schema like this, which was that actually the, ar the most archaic forms and the erectus forms don't really lead to humans via Neanderthals. Neanderthals seem to branch off in a separate direction and they're not a good ancestor for us. Um, and instead, the, 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 the archaic African specimens, the earliest African human-looking specimens, make a better ancestor. So that was the genesis for him of the out-of-Africa uh, hypothesis. Now, if we're going to look at that hypothesis, how do we test it? Um, what we often do when we're testing hypotheses is we try and make some predictions. So if this were true, what would we expect to see when we collect information of this kind? Uh, and how does the, does, the, does the information we collect better fit one hypothesis or the other? So if we look at the three kinds of evidence here, what do we see? So if we look at the fossil record, if we subscribe to the multi-regionalism view, the oldest fossils that look like us, what we call anatomically modern humans, could be found anywhere. They could be found in, in Britain, they could be found in China, uh, Java, India, Africa, anywhere. Uh, whereas the recent African origins view would say, no, they're going to be in Africa. Um, I left that bit about cultural universals. I'm not going to talk about that today, actually. That should have been deleted. If we look at the geographical distribution of genetic diversity, so where, where are humans most genetically diverse? The assumption is that they will be most genetically diverse in the place where they originated, because they've been there longest and they've been diverging there longest. And if they move to other places, there will be inevitably be a kind of population bottleneck which will remove some of the variation as they, as they move there. So if we look at multi-regionalism, the greatest diversity could be anywhere. could be in Asia, could be uh, in Europe, could be in Africa. But the recent African origin says, no, it, Africa is where we expect to see that diversity. And then finally, the most uh, perhaps compelling line of argument is to use molecular phylogenetics, which is where we line up, we, we get sequences from people, uh, and we line up what we call homologous sequences, uh, and we look at the patterns of change in those alignments to see uh, if we can then draw a family tree, a phylogenetic tree, based on the variation seen in those sequences. And we can work out where do we think the most recent common ancestor of humans came from. If we do that with a multi-regionalism view, it could be anywhere. Maybe that we find the most diversity in northern China or Southeast Asia or whatever. But according to the recent African origins view, that most recent common ancestor will be in Africa. So what do we find? Well, in terms of the fossil record, it's quite clear. The earliest fossils that look like us, that are anatomically modern humans, are found in Africa. And in particular, two sites uh, are, are the oldest. The paper, uh, papers here in Nature have just done screen grabs from the uh, abstracts and the references down there. These two sites here predate anything we see outside Africa by a considerable margin. So in Ethiopia, in Omu Kibush, we see 195,000-year-old samples, uh, specimens there. Um, and also in Ethiopia, not far away from there, uh, 154 to 160,000 years ago. Whereas uh, outside, we have in this, as I say, these Palestinian samples, they are variously dated to about 80 to 120,000 years ago, so still considerably younger. Uh, but <coughs> in a sense, they're just outside Africa. If you want to look further afield, strangely, the oldest specimens you find are uh, in, in Australia um, and also in China, quite a long way from, from Africa. But you know, there is there's a huge difference here in terms of the uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, age. Uh, between the, Afri the earliest African samples and those other ones. If you look at the geographical distribution of diversity in various kind of genetic loci and using various genetic approaches, this is a bit of an old summary here. It comes from a textbook. Uh, but it's summarized, and, and there, I haven't put the references in there. You can look at the textbook if you're interested. 
But if you look at a number of different measures, you can see that the consensus view is that diversity um, is highest here in Africa. There are a couple of examples where perhaps it wasn't marginally more in Asia for this big globe and flanking region, uh, and similarly these, these markers here. But in fact, both of those studies have been criticised on methodological grounds. So just looking at how much variation there is, uh, here's a, a more detailed study that was done in 1996 looking at uh, a particular locus, the CD4 locus, um, and here they come to this conclusion that this alu deletion always associated with single angle, blah, 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 uh, in, in non-African and in northeast <coughs> African populations, but associated with a wide range of alleles in the sub-Saharan African populations. So much more variation seen in sub-Saharan Africa than anywhere else in the world. And this, as they say, this global pattern of haplotype variation and linkage disequilibrium suggests a common and recent African origin for all non-African human populations. <coughs> Here's another line of evidence from a, a more recent paper. This is looking at uh, enzyme polymorphism. So you can, various enzymes that you may have in your body uh, from one individual to another, they may vary just slightly in their amino acid composition, and you can run those enzymes out on a gel, and you can look for variation, and then tabulate all that variation and draw a tree. That's what they've done. And what they find is that the African populations are most, by far the most um, distant from all the others and the most variable uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> how much variation there is in there. So we're kind of poised for, to expect that the molecular phylogenetics will tell us a similar picture. So what do we find? Well, basically two lines of evidence have predominated in this. Um, one is looking at mitochondrial DNA, and we mentioned that before when we were talking about uh, Neanderthals. Uh, that allows you to sample the maternal lineage. So you get your mitochondrial DNA from your mother, she gets it from her mother, she got it from her mother, and so on all the way back. Of course, when you're sampling that lineage, you're only sampling one of many lineages. So if you go back, you know, you've got four grandparents, but you're just sampling one of those four grandparents and one of eight great-grandparents and so on back. So you're getting a snapshot of one lineage, but it can be very informative. Similarly with the Y chromosome, it's following the opposite uh, route. It's going from uh, male to male to male. So a man passes, uh, well, a man will have got his Y chromosome from his father, who would have got it from his father, and so on back. It's worth stressing that if you trace back the most recent common ancestors, say, of the Y chromosome or the mitochondria, um, it may not give you the most recent common ancestor of all of the people, say, in this room or all of the people on the planet, uh, because it is only sampling that one lineage. And if you think about it, if you just do the calculations as to how many, let's say you have two children and each of those has two children and so on, um, you can work out that within a few, say within 20 generations you have a million descendants, within 40 generations you've got a million, million descendants, which is far more than there are people in the world. It, it, it's clear that we, have, we do have a most recent common ancestor much more recently than what these lineages are telling us. Anyway, I'm getting off the topic a bit. Let's get back to... What does the mitochondrial DNA tell us about uh, this issue? Well, the first glimpse of what uh, is, has been poetically called mitochondrial Eve, the, an the ancestor of all the, the mitochondrial lineages that we now see in humanity, first glimpse was in 1987, when this paper, Can et al., they analysed mitochondrial DNA from 147 individuals using 12 restriction enzymes. So they didn't actually sequence it, but they cut it up and looked at the patterns. And they were able to construct a tree from that data, uh, and they made some assumptions using uh, modern variation as to how uh, quickly that uh, DNA changed, and they came up with a route for their phylogenetic tree in Africa about 200,000 years ago. So not too dissimilar from what we see when we look at the fossil record. And they make this point. All these mitochondrial DNAs stem from one woman who is postulated to have lived about 200,000 years ago, probably in Africa. Sometimes also called African Eve. So it's, I, I think it's actually a really quite a poetic kind of discovery that there, there is one woman there that was the ancestor of all of these mitochondria that we're carrying at the moment. Um, and she lived in Africa. There were some criticisms of that paper. It was not uh, 
perfect by any means. 18 out of the 20 so-called African samples actually came from African Americans. <laughs> and we know that African Americans, there's quite a considerable admixture from the European lineages and even to some degree from Native American lineages, so they're not purely African. Methodology wasn't ideal, various problems there. And some people said, well, it's a bit misleading to talk about mitochondrial Eve because it harks back to the Bible and this was the first woman or the only woman of her time. It wasn't true at all. There were many other women at the same time. It's just that their lineages died out and that particular individual's lineage survived to the modern day and, and, and is a result that is responsible for the diversification. A few years later, uh, a, a second more in, uh, intensive study was carried out looking at 53 individuals looking at complete mitochondrial uh, DNA. And here they used, quote, I'm, I'm not trying to offend anyone, real Africans, people who actually have a, a, a long lineage I, I, in Africa. Uh, and, and what they found was that there was a complete separation here of African and non-African lineages. So above this line here, this is all the people who are not African. And below this line are all the Africans. And you can see that um, there's this one branch here which contains African and uh, non-African lineages. But there are a large number of lineages over here that are exclusively African. These are quite deep branches. So um, what we, what this, uh, and also if you look at the amount of variation seen, say, between Chinese and <coughs> Australians and Dutch and English and so on, very, very little variation compared to all the variation you're seeing here in Africa. <coughs> so what they said was this suggests that there was a most recent common ancestor for all of these individuals around 172,000 years ago, you know, roughly what the previous study said. And for all of the people who were from outside Africa, uh, for that main African, non-African branch, about 52,000 years ago. So this was the first hard evidence, really, from molecular phylogenetics for the out-of-Africa uh, 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 hypothesis. <coughs> this is from a, a recent review here, um, and this summarizes a much more up-to-date view of our understanding of these lineages, the mitochondrial lineages. And here, this is all, you can see all the non-African lineages derived from this one haplogroup, so-called L3 haplogroup. But over here... These are all African lineages, very deep. And we're going to talk about these, these, these L0 and L1 later in the course when we talk about um, Bushmen and, and uh, populations in Africa. But basically, uh, you can see at the bottom here, this is sub-Saharan Africa, these yellow ones. So all of these lineages, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and then everything else scrunched into one lineage there. And you get the same picture when you look at Y-chromosomal data. So that you get, uh, this is more of a, a figurative picture, but basically it's the same kind of pattern, that all the non-Africans here are in one little branch with a few, other, a few of the Africans, but there are other African branches that are far deeper and far more diverse. Um, here the Y-atom is thought to only be fairly recent, about 60,000 years ago. Again, not the only male of his time. And if you think about it, it, when that last common ancestor of all extant Y chromosomes lived depends on what's going on today. So if we took all the, all the Bushmen in, in South Africa uh, and um, they were removed, you know, that maybe they died out, and there was a genocide or something, then this target would move dramatically forward and, and similarly as, as you take other lineages out. But uh, this is the modern view again here. This is sub-Saharan Africa here. You can see a couple of bits of sub-Saharan Africa either side of this block of, first block of non-African. But all the non-African lineages are coming out of this CR haplogroup. Uh, and there are these deep uh, branches over here. This is just <coughs> a, a slide I found that uh, summarizes basically uh, the evidence from both directions, from the mitochondria evidence and the Y chromosome evidence. And both of them point to the earliest branches in Africa and then diversification outside of Africa, but all of that contained in, within a uh, single branch coming out of Africa. So a modern view is that actually what happened then was that humans originated in Africa, 
they started to diversify in Africa, and different lineages arose within Africa. It's thought that they, um, we mentioned those uh, very early specimens from outside of Africa in Palestine. It's thought that that was perhaps probably a, a, a dead end, that those individuals perhaps came out of Africa but didn't leave any progeny anywhere. And everyone else from outside of Africa are descendants of individuals who left Africa about 60,000 years ago. So there was an out of Africa exodus um, and... One of the most remarkable things, again, all that European-centric view that you had 100 years ago is blown away. Actually, you'd think that these people would say, oh, let's go up to Europe because it's nice up there. They didn't. They actually came along here and they ended up in Australia very, very quickly after they left uh, Africa. And that's, you know, we get the earliest fossils from there. And it's thought that they took this, uh, what's not being perfectly called the beachcomber route. They just went along the coast um, and perhaps were living off of uh, seafood and, and um, foraging, uh, for, you know, maybe fishing a bit and all that as they went along that route. The uh, counterintuitive point that's made is that, Af that after this out of Africa, it took a long time, you know, maybe 15,000 years before anatomically modern humans appeared in Europe. Perhaps they were kept at bay by the Neanderthals, or perhaps they just didn't like the landscape or the weather and never went there, I don't know. Um, and similarly, the, the Americas, it's generally accepted the peopling of the Americas, this is the last major continental landmass to be uh, peopled, uh, and that was very recent, maybe 15,000 years ago, and we'll say more about that later in the course. Now, those of you who stayed awake in the last lecture will remember that it wasn't quite that simple. So this is accounting for over 90% of our ancestry, people like many of you and me who have this white skin, most of our ancestry is coming along there, 90 odd percent. But there was somewhere along the line interbreeding with Neanderthals, accounting for a few percent, and for some lineages, including Australian Aborigines, there was some interbreeding from Denisovans. But if we're going to be kind of Africanist about this, we can just say that's a few percent, it's irrelevant. Actually, we're all Africans because we all come out of Africa through this route and re very recently. So there's, a, there's kind of some, some debate as to where that exodus occurred. I think most people suggest that it came, it, it took place here, the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula, crossing from, well, from Eric, what's now Eritrea, uh, called the, the, the Gate of Grief. Um, it's got an Arabic name, but I can't remember it. Baal, Baal something or other. But uh, that was, um, today is only about 12 miles wide, but in the past, when uh, sea levels were different, it was actually a bit, uh, quite a good deal narrower, and it's quite plausible that, that humans could have rafted across there. Um, and it appears that there are fresh springs along this coast as well. Um, and there's some evidence on Eritrea that humans were actually eating shellfish, uh, and engaging in this kind of beachcomber lifestyle. So that kind of fits with this idea. In Chris Stringer's book, which I did bring along, there it is, um, it's probably worth reading if you really want to get into this subject. Um, you know, you're supposed to do a bit of external reading. It is, it's still only a hardback, so you'd have to fish out a bit of money for it, but you might want to get it from the library if you can. In there, he takes the view, well, actually, they could have just walked up this side of the Red Sea and then walk down the other side of the Red Sea or, or whatever. It, 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 he doesn't seem to be quite so wedded to the idea that they came across here from Ethiopia or Eritrea. So we, we don't have any direct evidence of where they first emerged from Africa, but those are the two options. And there's been some studies done to look at this kind of very rapid beachcomber exodus and, and movement along the South Asian uh, sea uh, coast there um, and there are these remnant, so-called remnant populations, where you can uh, drawing up phylogenetic trees from these individual <coughs> populations scattered around, say the Andaman Isles, the Nicobar Islands, and so forth. These individuals show some evidence that there was a single dispersal through uh, Asia out of Africa uh, that would have taken people to um, Australia. And you can do a rough calculation. They reckon that there's 
you know, a, a, a kilometer or, f uh, or so a few per year uh, in terms of migration. So if you think about that, it's not entirely implausible um, that people move at that <coughs> kind of uh, rate. And I mean, this is a mind-blowing fact that it, the rough upper estimate of the number of women who left Africa 60,000 years ago comes out about 600. So we're talking hundreds, at most a few thousand people leading Afri leaving Africa and giving rise to all the peoples of the world outside of Africa. Uh, I think that's an amazing thought. There is evidence from other sources as well. Uh, many humans carry within their stomach an organism called H. pylori. He look back to pylori. Um, and this is spread typically within families from parents, mothers to children. Um, and it's got a very high mutation rate. So if you look at H. pylori sequences from around the world, you can try and reconstruct human uh, migrations as well. And a team headed by Mark Achman, who's now um, in Cork, uh, did this a few years ago, and they found, to cut a long story short, they found support for the out of Africa theory. They found that the, there was evidence of these two African populations, the European population and the East Asian population, but one of these African populations by far the furthest away in terms of branching, and if you try and draw a sort of a cladogram, you can see the African branch is coming off first, and then Europe and East Asia being the most recently diverging. And they actually looked at variation within uh, the organism, and, and they could find that uh, evidence using various kinds of uh, analyses that, that there was clear evidence that diversification, uh, diversity was highest in Africa and petered out as you got out of Africa. Another strange place to look for evidence of this kind of thing is in lice. Uh, lice is an irregular plural of louse. Uh, and anyone who's read Stephen Pinker's book about uh, language instinct will know that means that we must have had contact and have to speak about lice and, uh, and the louse uh, continuously during our history, mother to child and so forth. So it's a kind of daunting thought that lice have always been with us for as long as our languages uh, we can trace back. Um, and uh, Darwin actually raised this issue that maybe there were different kinds of lice on different races, different varieties of human beings. He actually wrote this letter saying, you know, are they distinct or not? Actually, an interesting paper that came out a few years ago looked at this issue, uh, looked at the phylogenies of lice and said, well, actually, there are two big branches, these two big clades, one of which is found only in the New World and is actually so divergent from the others that it probably diverged over a million years ago. So long before, <coughs> if we're saying 200,000 years is a ballpark figure for the origins of our species, long before our species evolved. So what they took that to mean, and I think it's, it is generally accepted, is there must have been contact between an archaic human form, so some form of of Homo erectus, perhaps. Uh, maybe the Denisovans, given that they were in a kind of right ballpark in that part of Asia. Uh, so we know that uh, America was peopled from, the, from Asia, from the areas of Siberia. Maybe the Denisovans gave this kind of head louse to, uh, to, the, to the ancestors of the people that uh, colonized America. So this is, again, it's showing us that we have this out of Africa idea, but we have some nuances to it as well. So in conclusion, it's clear that anatomically modern humans first appeared in Africa. Genetic diversity for most loci is higher in Africa. Most phylogenies, when you look at individual loci, show a root in Africa, and this is particularly true for mitochondrial Eve and Y. Adam. And the evidence from human DNA, lice, and microbes all consistent with this idea of recent African origins, but with some African, uh, some archaic admixture. So in, in his book, Chris Stringer actually summarizes our most recent uh, consensus, which is that his view initially was, that's it, we're all Africans under the skin, 100%. At the other extreme, people like Woolpoff say no, 0% for that theory, it's all multi-regionalism in between some other ideas. Now we do seem to have a consensus that, that this pendulum has swung back and forth, but it's settled here 
that we do have a recent African origin for 95% of your genome, of my genome, those of us who are not recent African you know, in the last few hundred years, ancestry. Uh, and, and we just have a small degree of admixture from these archaic populations. Just to, to put a political spin on this, in the olden days, you know, all those racist Europeans, they used to love classifying people. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that Kuhn came up with, this idea that there were these African race, Australian race, Asian race, European, American, Oceanic. They're all nicely pigeonholed in that way and all quite separate. And all. Uh, the view for modern genetics is obviously nothing of the, of the kind. This is an interesting paper that looks at race in a kind of legal framework and looks at the evolutionary evidence and basically... This is what we have, this very messy kind of picture where one group of Africans gave rise to non-Africans. Australians are more closely related to Europeans than, than most Africans are. Uh, Eurasians are split to Asians and Europeans. And, uh, Native Americans are actually more closely related to most Asians than they are to anyone else, and so on. A few years ago, um, when there was a television <coughs> program with Alice Roberts on uh, the Daily Mail, published a reconstruction of a early European skull. Um, this was done by Alice Roberts, and uh, well, by people working, uh, presenting their results on the program, and they made this person have dark skin. Now you can imagine what the people who read the Daily Mail thought of that, that this was abomination, and in fact it's just, it, it's not nice, to, some of that material is still available online, not nice to see what they said. But unfortunately, Daily Mail readers have to face up to the fact that our, all of their ancestors were Africans, and very recently at that. In fact, if you look at it this way, we are, anyone in this room, if we put your mother uh, in a queue behind you and her mother behind her, and we made them all line up, we would probably wouldn't get to the other side of the campus before we got back to Africa. None of us are known uh, any more than... Uh, 4,000 mothers away from Africa, in a sense. So we're all Africans under the skin. And this is where I bring in the rat to actually summarise what we've said. So this is a friend of mine, Baba Brinkman. He's produced a... Uh, on the back of the book, I produced a rough guide to evolution. I suggested that for the Darwin Bicentenary a couple of years ago, why doesn't he create the rat guide to evolution? And uh, he's a, a genius when it comes to using words. He actually did this. Uh, I, I would uh, ask all of you to go and Google it and go and look at the Rap Guide to Evolution. And we hope, we're hoping as part of the Great Read at Birmingham Initiative, he will come and perform the Rap Guide to Evolution here uh, later this term. But anyone who, who knows about hip hop will recognize that he often takes existing hip hop tunes and just remixes them with his own words. And this is an example here. So I'm just, we've just got, have you got another lecture straight after? Let me just play you this. It's about five minutes long, at no more, and, and you can see what you think. And if you stay the course, there will be a special invitation uh, at the end of it to become a rap artist. As soon as you start seeing this evolutionary algorithm, variation plus selection plus heritability, you start seeing it everywhere. It drives you a little insane. You're like John Nash. Like, there's a <laughs> so one form of uh, one form of evolution that I discovered it takes place in my iPod. I load it up with hundreds of thousands of songs, and I listen to them all on shuffle. And the songs that pop up that I don't like so much get deleted next time I'm in iTunes. And the songs that pop up that I really like don't get deleted. They get selected for. And over time, my playlists evolve. Okay, one group that's been in my playlist since I first got an iPod is called Dead Prez, and they have a song called I'm an African, just like this, okay? So they're using this song in the context of black nationalism. Obviously, that's not the context I'm going to use this song in. Okay, I'm going to use this song in the context of unity of common descent, because I've seen videos of Dead Prez performing this song, and there is a call and response chorus, and they're like, I'm an African, and the whole crowd shouts back, I'm an African, and all the white kids do it too, and every race because it's hip hop, right? And when I saw that in the video, I was like, how ironic. Uh, because, uh, because they are African. Everyone is an African, right? It doesn't matter what your race is. The color of your skin just tells us something about how long ago your ancestors left Africa. But if you go back far enough, everyone on this whole planet is an African. So this is like the most inclusive song ever written in history. <laughs> so, 
what we're going to do is we're going to do this call and response thing, okay? So I'm going to say, I'm an African, and you're going to look in my eyes, and you're going to see that I believe, I'm not gonna get I believe in every word. I am an African. You're not going to be like, clever game, white boy. <laughs> He's an African, and you're going to shout it back at me, and you're going to believe it too, because you're going to feel it in your DNA, because that's where it comes from. Okay? So we're going to try this out. I'm an African. I'm an African. Yeah, so I know what's happening. I'm an African. I'm an African. Okay, we got to fix this. <laughs> Note that the song is I'm uh, African. Some people are saying I'm an African. <laughs> Grammatical correct in society. That's an error. If I'm not African, people sometimes ask me, why do rappers mess with grammar? Is it because they're grammatical rebels as well as political rebels? No, if you think about it, if they left the N in there, then the title of the song in the Chef Paul Khan response would be, I'm an African. I'm an African. It sounds like it's saying, I'm really naff. Uh, <laughs> understand this. North American maybe not so much, but naff is not a good word. So uh, I have to drop the end so that it becomes this kind of staccato, syncopated rhythm, like, I'm an African. I'm an African, I'm an African. So I'm gonna, we'll do this one more time, but this time I don't want to hear the word naff popping out of the crowd at all. I just want to hear, I'm an African, all right? I'm an African. I'm an African. Yeah, and I know what's happening. I'm an African. I'm an African. And there's a couple ends in there. So. <laughs> yeah. Africa. I'm an African, I'm an African, yeah, and I know what's happening. I'm an African, I'm an African. Archaeologists know what's happening. You are African, you are African, yeah. Do you know what's happening? I'm an African, I'm an African. Geneticists know what's happening. No, I wasn't born in Canada, but Africa's my mama. Cause that's where my mama got her mitochondria. You can try to fight if you want to, but it's not gonna change me. Cause it's plain to see Africans are my people. Not plain to see, then your eyes deceive you. I'm talking primeval. The DNA in my veins tells a story that reasonable people find believable, but it might even blow your transistors. Africa is the home of our most recent common ancestors, which means human beings are all brothers and sisters. You check the massive evidence of Homo erectus and Australopithecus afarensis in the fossil record, and then try to tell me that we're not all connected. The fossil record has gaps, but no contradictions, and it complements the evidence in your chromosomes. So I came to let you know about your ancestral home. I'm an African. Okay. We'll pause there. You can listen to it at home in your, at your own time. Now, Baba Brinkman is actually making videos to go with each of his uh, rap songs in the Rap Guide to Evolution. He's actually put three of them up online already. If you Google Rap Guide to Evolution, you'll find them. But he's also looking for... Interrupt you, but we've got the room at two. All right, okay, I'll be out in two seconds. He's actually looking for volunteers to lip sync to I'm an African, and he wants to put your faces into a rap video. So if anyone wants to do that, come and contact, contact me afterwards, send me an email, and we'll see if we can organize that. You, you can just video yourself, don't have to come and do it anywhere, but he's, he's very keen that he gets as many people as possible. <laughs>